Cut Optimization Study Group. And today uh, I'm going to introduce the uh, gradient descent methods and the stochastic gradient method methods, um, uh, which are very simple and famous methods in stochastic optimization problems. So, um, so uh, the, this talk has like two parts. So I will firstly introduce like the first three parts and the Victoria will talk about some uh, stochastic subgradient methods uh, for uh, some certain scenarios and make some conclusion. Um, yeah, let's start with the introduction. Um, last time we talked about some basics of the stochastic optimization problems and it can be applied in many fields such as communications, tracking, control theory, system identification, and machine learning. Today, I would like to introduce the gradient-based methods from the machine learning perspectives. So um, here is a typical image classification problem in machine learning, uh, where we have a bunch of uh, images of dogs and cats. And the machine learning aims to learn some hierarchical representations from these images to construct a model to classify or to distinguish which images are cats and which images are dogs. So these cats and dogs are our labels. And in this case, we wish to learn a good model such that uh, it inputs, uh, it has some inputs training samples and it outputs the predicted labels. And we wish this model um, can have a very good prediction error for these given uh, images. And mathematically, we can represent this scenario as an optimization problem uh, like this. So here, the xi denotes the training samples and yi denotes the uh, corresponding label. And h is the model that receives the training samples and outputs the predict label. And this one function is the indicator function. So if the model produces the correct result given some images, for example, given a cat image, it produces the uh, label cat, then this error is zero. And otherwise, this error is one. For example, it makes the wrong decision. So that is to say, we wish to learn a model that can distinguish the given samples as many as possible. Or we can consider a um, regression problems as follows. We have some uh, data points, xi and yi in two dimensions. And we wish to learn a linear function, y is equal to ax plus b, that fits this data with the minimum mean squared error. And this problem is very well known as the least square problem uh, or linear li uh, least square problem. And we can formulate this as an optimization problem as well uh, in this way. And uh, we know that in this case, A and B both have the uh, closed form solution. But however, in most of the cases, it is relatively hard to get closed form solution. And from those two examples, many machine learning problems can be converted into uh, the following optimization problems such that we wish to minimize this some f, uh, capital F, W, that is the sum of uh, this guy. And I'll explain what does this mean. So here, the i is the uh, training samples. And if we know uh, this uh, training sample consists of the uh, input features and output label, then we can represent it as uh, xi and yi for a pair. And this W is the model parameters. For example, in the least square problems, A and B uh, can be uh, represented as uh, the model parameters. And here we have some performance criterions or called the loss function or cost function that receives the data and model parameters and outputs some non-negative value. So if this loss function is larger, then it means that the performance is worse. And our aim is to minimize this, the model param uh, Our aim is to learn some uh, model parameters that minimizes this quantity, uh, the capital FW in this case. Um, so how to do it? 
Uh, as said before, usually we do not have the uh, closed form solution to this problem, but if the loss function is convex and differentiable with respect to W, we can use the gradient descent to search for the optimal solution. For example, uh, firstly, uh, given a uh, W, we want to uh, shift a bit around W. For, uh, for example, we, we denote it by some eta times uh, uh, delta W for, uh, uh, for this objective function. And with the uh, first order Taylor approximation, we can expand this loss into two terms. So the first term is the uh, previous uh, loss and the second term is the uh, updated component. And we wish to minimize this, the uh, right-hand side. So actually it is equivalent to minimize the second term. Um, so uh, we can see that here, this eta is some uh, positive constant and this gradient is some fixed uh, vector. And if we want to uh, minimize the second term, the best delta W should be chosen as the uh, negative gradient. So uh, you can think uh, uh, the delta W and the gradient as two vectors and their product is minimized when they have the opposite direction. So uh, based on these, we will end up with the gradient descent method. So for example, we choose some initial uh, point W0 and the certain step size eta t and we run the iteration in such way that WT plus, uh, WT plus one is equal to WT minus eta t times the uh, gradient of our objective function. Specifically, we will calculate the gradient for each data sample and take the average. Then we take the steps proportional to the negative of the whole gradient. And uh, one may ask, uh, when does this stop? then naturally we uh, want to achieve the epsilon suboptimality for this objective function. That is the current loss is close to the optimal loss up to, up to some constant epsilon. Then we, then we stop. So to visualize it, there are two classical pictures that describe the gradient descent. From the left figure, the, lo uh, the loss can be visualized as a contour plot for certain parameter W. And then the outer circle represents the higher loss and the inner circle represents the uh, lower loss. So if we start from some initial point uh, W0 here, and we wish to approach W star in the center. And if we run the uh, gradient descent, the solution will go towards the uh, optimal solution with the reverse direction of the gradient. So this is uh, from the contour plot uh, to see the gradient descent, or we can consider the minimizing a quadratic function that we choose some uh, initial point W0 here. And if we choose appropriate step size, uh, the solution will gradually move towards to the, lower, uh, to the lowest point or to the optimal W star in this case. Uh, so the question is how to choose the appropriate eta t so that uh, it is guaranteed a w will converge to the optimal solution. And here I will just briefly introduce the con convergence rate, uh, but the proofs are omitted here. Like for those who are interested in the proof, one can refer to the book Convex Optimization by Boyd or Numerical Optimization by Nostel. Um, so uh, for the convergence rate of the gradient descent, if we further assume that the gradient is uh, of uh, capital FW is L Lipschitz continuous. So this is equivalently to say that uh, this uh, matrix, uh, this matrix Li minus the Hessian uh, is positive de uh, semi-definite uh, if F is twice di differentiable. Uh, then if we choose a fixed step size, eta t that is smaller than one over L. Then in this theorem, we see that the error between the loss of wt at uh, time t and the optimal loss uh, is bounded by some uh, constant divided by t. So we can see that when t goes to infinity, the rent, uh, the, this bound will goes to zero. Then the convergence rate with respect to the iteration t is 
O of 1 over T. And if we want to achieve the epsilon suboptimality, and we need at least 1 over epsilon iterations to achieve this error. And furthermore, if um, this capital uh, FW is mu strongly convex, then we choose the constant step size that is smaller than 2 over uh, mu plus L, or with the uh, backtracking line search methods, the convergence rate in this case will be C to the T. Then where C is some constant between 0 and 1. And you can see that uh, the right-hand side will also goes to 0 uh, when T goes to infinity. And this is known as the linear convergence. And if we want to achieve the epsilon suboptimality, we will need at least um, O of log 1 over epsilon iterations, which is much faster than the previous case, since we make stronger uh, assumptions in uh, here. So uh, I will just like quickly go through the uh, convergence rate for the gradient descent methods. Uh, and next I will, uh, I will uh, explain uh, the, the drawbacks of the uh, gradient method, uh, sorry, the gradient descent methods. So uh, there are two main drawbacks of the gradient uh, descent. One is from the computational perspectives. Be uh, since we need to uh, calculate uh, the gradient for all data samples, so this uh, computing the full gradient is very time and memory consuming. And next, the if the loss function is non-convex, then the solution can be stuck in the stationary point, which is not a local minima. For example, the gradient descent can be ended up with a saddle point where the gradient is zero, but is, it is neither a minima or maxima as shown in this figure. But today, uh, it is out of, uh, a little bit out of scope today and we will, will not like talk deep into this point. And, so to address uh, the first problems, uh, we, uh, we, we will introduce the uh, stochastic gradient descent. So one possible way uh, to address the uh, computational cost problem is the uh, stochastic gradient descent. Uh, instead of computing the uh, full gradient of the capital FW for each iteration, we just randomly pick up some data sample ZT from the uh, whole data set at time t. And we will calculate the gradient only once. So the uh, update iteration can be written uh, uh, in this way. So with these similar uh, settings in gradient descent, uh, now the, uh, update, the updating equation is wt plus one is equal to wt minus the step size times the single gradient here. And it will save a lot of uh, computational costs, of course. But why does this work? Uh, since here, ZT is actually randomly selected from uh, our data sets. So ZT is actually a random variable. So this gradient is actually a random variable. So if we take the expectation of this gradient with respect to the sample ZT, this is exactly the full gradient as we see in the gradient descent. So this choice will lead to an unbiased estimate of the full gradient, but may suffer from high variance. Um, anyway, it usually works in, in large, scale, large scale problem, uh, like when n is sufficiently large. And let's take a look at the performance of SGD compared to the gradient descent. So uh, in this counter plot, this uh, blue curve, uh, sorry, this uh, red curve is the uh, gradient descent method. And this, uh, uh, these uh, black lines are the uh, grid, uh, stochastic gradient descent. And from this figure, we can see that uh, the stochastic gradient descent goes towards the minimum in a very random way, since the single derivative does not always produce the right directions. And some remarks on the uh, stochastic gradient descent. First, as, as I said before, uh, it's about the computational cost. For example, for a n, n data sample uh, and p iterations, uh, we assume that the computational uh, cost for calculating the uh, gradient is one, then the computational cost of the gradient is actually np, and the cost of 
stochastic gradient is p, so which is like n times less than the gradient descent method. However, the SGD uh, does not always produce the uh, descending directions as the uh, direct uh, as the gradient is very noisy in the, in this case, and if we choose the constant step size, the solution of the SGD will not converge to the optimal value. It will just bounce around the optimal value. And we will see this later on. So the question is, do we have the convergence analysis for stochastic gradient descent? And uh, now we are in the position to, uh, uh, to do the uh, convergence analysis for stochastic gradient descent. Um, since our uh, main objective is minimize the, uh, uh, this loss function, this average loss function, a capital FW, but in the uh, stochastic gradient descent, uh, as we randomly pick uh, the data samples every iteration, so this WT is actually depends on all of the uh, samples that we chose. So this WT is actually a random variable. So we will care about the expected performance of WT. And we want to achieve the epsilon suboptimality such that the expected error in this case is less than epsilon after T iterations. So we will make the following assumptions. Firstly, uh, the, this is a very general assumption that we made in the gradient descent method as well. So the function is mu strongly convex and the gradient is L Lipschitz continuous as before. And we further assume that ZT is randomly picked such that the gradient is an unbiased estimate of the full gradient. And we further assume the variance of the gradient is bounded by sigma square. This indicates that the estimate is not very far away from the full gradient. And under these assumptions, with the constant step size that is smaller than one over L, we will end up uh, the bound like this. So in this bound, we have two components. The first term is some constant that depends on the step size and the noise uh, and the variance. And the second term converges to zero linearly as T increases. So at the beginning, we will have a uh, linear convergence but when t goes to infinity, these uh, fw will converge to some neighborhood of the optimal value. So the variation in this gradient computation prevents further progress if we use constant step size. And for the uh, proof of this theorem, one can refer to the paper uh, that is shown below. And we will uh, also uh, upload the slides later on uh, if you are interested. Uh, so the question is, can SGD converge to the optimal value uh, like uh, with the same settings? Yes, but now the step size should not should be time variant and specifically with the diminishing step size. So if we choose the step size eta t to be some constant divided by t plus one, where theta is some, uh, so where theta is some, uh, some value that is greater than one over mu, then the SGD, uh, will achieve uh, the convergence like this. So from the uh, bound, we can see that when t goes to infinity, now this uh, error will go to zero. And we can see the convergence rate in this case is like one over t. Uh, so with the same assumptions, we can only achieve uh, one uh, O of one over t convergence rate, which is much slower than the gradient descent uh, as in, in, in that case, we can achieve O of log one over, uh, oh, sorry, that can achieve the linear convergence in, for the gradient descent. Uh, this is due to the uh, variance that shown up in the, grid, uh, in the stochastic gradient descent. So uh, now we are in the position to see the differences between the gradient descent methods and the stochastic gradient met methods in terms of the computational cost. So to achieve the uh, epsilon suboptimality, uh, the uh, gradient descent needs a uh, log one over epsilon iterations. And for each iteration, the computational cost is around N. So the total cost would be N log one over epsilon. Uh, 
While for the stochastic gradient descent, the iteration complexity is one over epsilon and the total computation cost is uh, one over epsilon as well. And um, so we will have uh, the following remarks. Uh, for, uh, for sure, like for each iteration, the SGD has uh, less computational cost uh, than the gradient descent. And for those large scale uh, problems, for example, when N is very large or uh, N uh, with a moderate epsilon, we can, uh, the uh, stochastic gradient descent can achieve uh, faster convergence than the gradient descent uh, in terms of the computational cost. And the third, uh, the third point is the, uh, due to the stochastic gradient descent ha have some uh, variance in the, or have some noise in, in its gradient. So it can get rid of some saddle points uh, due to the variance. So uh, I would uh, not like go deep into uh, this point, but, but if someone is interested in this, in some theoretical analysis for this point, uh, you can uh, refer to the paper shown below. And we have seen that the gradient uh, in the stochastic gradient descent method is very, actually very noisy. So naturally we, we, can, uh, we want to decrease uh, the variance uh, of the gradient. So um, we can increase, actually we can increase the number of samples that we picked. For example, if we pick K samples randomly from the data set, where K is much smaller than N, but maybe uh, larger than one, uh, we can run the mini batch stochastic gradient descent. And in this case, the variance will just be reduced K times, but the computational cost will also increase K times. Uh, but in practical, it works pretty well. So look at an example uh, uh, from uh, the uh, convex optimization course by Tish Birani, um, where they uh, do an experimental uh, on the logistic regression problems with 10,000 samples. And they compare the results with the stochastic gradient descent uh, with different mini batches. For example, the red line corresponds to the uh, uh, K equals to one, and the green line uh, corresponds to K equals 10, and this blue line corresponds to K equals uh, 100. And this uh, black curve is the full gradient where they take, uh, where, where, where K is equal to 10,000 uh, uh, for the full gradient. And we can see that um, when K is equal to 100, the performance is relatively close to the full gradient and it saves a lot of computational costs in practical applications. Um, and another important question is that, can we achieve uh, log one over epsilon rate with calculating the gradient only once? Yes. So this is a very new uh, uh, research that is like from maybe uh, 2012 or 2013, some, sometime like that. Uh, so one typical algorithm is the stochastic average gradient. So the algorithm looks like this, like by choosing some initial parameter W0, we firstly compute the gradient for all samples and store these gradients. And in the next iteration, we randomly pick a sample and update W in an averaged way, like in here, um, where we only update the gradient that is chosen. For example, if we chose uh, Z, the i, where i is equal to uh, maybe some random values, then we only update the, uh, the gradient for this sample and maintain the rest uh, gradient that we calculated at the beginning. And uh, with this framework, uh, we can achieve uh, the uh, faster convergence rates uh, with the constant step size. And in this case, the SAG, uh, gradient estimates are no longer unbiased, but they will greatly reduce the variance. Um, and now in this case, the iteration complexity uh, reduces to the uh, log one over epsilon. Uh, 
And there are also some other variants that uh, also have similar convergence rates. For example, the SDCA, SVRG, and SAGA. So if uh, you are interested in the noise reduction techniques, you can refer to these papers. Um, okay, finally on the uh, SVD, uh, if, uh, so as before, we only talk about like when N is relatively large, but if N is not very large, is it reasonable to stop with the epsilon suboptimality uh, when epsilon is a very small value? Sometimes data sample is actually very noisy. And if we simply, uh, if, if we simply minimizing the loss function for the given data sets, we might learn the noise as well, and it will cause the overfitting problems. And to see this, uh, let's take a look at the regression problems for uh, y equals sine to pi x plus n, where uh, x is the uh, x-axis and y is the uh, y-axis, and n is some uh, Gaussian noise. And uh, we are given some uh, data that, that, that are shown as the blue circles here. And we wish to learn the true function sine to pi x from the given data set. So we start with the uh, y equal to zero, for example, a flat line, and we run the gradient descent for these regression problems. And when we run two, two iterations, the red curve does not fit the data well. And this is known as the underfitting uh, problem. When t equals to uh, 100, in this case, this red line now fits the data quite well. And this is known as the uh, appropriate fitting. But when t comes to 5,000, we see that the curve has many spikes and meaning that the curve does not uh, only learn the true functions, but it also learned the uh, noise as well. And this situation is known as, as the overfitting. So even though we will have a very small loss when t uh, is very large, apparently this is not the, the function that we want. So we actually, we really, or what we really want is the case when t equals to 100, even though in this case, the loss is, is not minimal. Actually, uh, if, if samples are regarded as uh, random variables drawn from some uh, distribution p, we may consider minimizing the true risk such that we take the expected loss. So to visualize it, uh, here is a typical uh, 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 typical loss uh, figure for the uh, previous scenarios, and this red line is the true functions that we uh, sorry. This red line is the uh, capital uh, F W that uh, which is the uh, our objective functions uh, as shown in the beginning, which is known as the empirical loss. And we, we define the true loss, which is the F true WT here, uh, and where we will take the expectation with respect to uh, the data distribution. Since we assume that the data is modeled as a random variable drawn from some distribution P. And uh, actually, uh, given some data samples, if we just simply minimizing this, uh, our objective function, uh, capital F W T, um, this F true W T will increase at some certain uh, point. So, um, uh, it tells us we should stop earlier than we expected. So, uh, at the, in this case, the epsilon suboptimality will not work or uh, does not give a, a good estimation for the for the true functions that we really want to learn. Um, mm, so this is known as the uh, early stopping. Uh, and this early stopping work, uh, as, works as an implicit regularize, regularization techniques that prevents from the overfitting. And um, if, uh, and we would not go to details uh, today for the early stopping, but I mentioned it as a uh, caveat, since the overfitting can be problematic while using the uh, stochastic gradient descent in some specific problems. And uh, since SGD has many applications in different loss functions, 
For example, the other line, uh, the Tikhonov regularization, the loss uh, logistic regression, where the loss functions uh, are uh, differentiable re with respect to uh, W. But there are also many algorithms with non-differentiable functions, such as SVM, Lasso, perceptions, and neural networks. So how to deal with it? And talk, uh, Victoria will, will introduce the stochastic subgradient methods for uh, loss functions. And I will just hand over it to her. So thank you, Shatong. And let me just share my screen. Okay, so up to now we have talked about stochastic gradient descent and we have heard about the advantages. So for stochastic gradient descent to work best, we um, have certain assumptions. And a few um, of those assumptions are, for example, we assume we have a smooth optimization problem, or we assume that the input data that we sample is IID. And what the update formula does not do at the moment is it does not consider any additional information that we might have about, for example, a cost function or maybe about the underlying geometry of the problem. And so now this is why we decided to also talk about stochastic subgradient methods to just give an idea of what can be done if those assumptions do not hold. But first, before I start talking about the subgradient methods, let me summarize and um, um, show you where we are at the moment. So the main goal is to minimize a cost function. So what we try to do is we find, we try, we want to find the optimal point W, which um, gives us the optimal value, which is the minimum cost. And in an optimal scenario, what uh, we could do is, if we would know our function and our gradients of the function, we could reformulate the problem into um, a problem where we would just need to find the zeros and the roots of the real valued function. And in this case, we can just use Newton's method to solve the problem. But usually in reality, this is not always the case and we don't know our real function. But what we know is we have noisy observations, maybe because we have some observation noise or because of structural inaccuracies. And, um, and for, that, for that case, Roberts and Monroe proposed to use stochastic approximation based on this formula you can see here. So we basically try to stochastically approximate our optimal point Wt plus one. That will minimize the cost function f of w. And so now stochastic gradient descent is based on this update formula. And what we're trying to do is we want to stochastically approximate our original gradient descent. And so we get, uh, we start at some point and we go in the direction of the negative gradient by using a certain step size to get our new point. And as Shatong already mentioned, by picking our samples uniformly at random from our sample set, we can guarantee that the gradient estimate that we get will be an unbiased estimate of the true gradient. So now what happens um, if we have non-smooth functions that we want to optimize when we have some points that are not differentiable? And what is if we have additional information that we would like to incorporate in the optimization problem, for example, about the cost function, or maybe we have some underlying geometry information that we have? And one question is also, what do we do if our input samples are non-IID? But we still would like to use a method based on stochastic gradient descent. And we have still the goal to minimize our empirical risk. So this is the same goal as we had in the first part of the talk. And now the goal is to show you, give you some ideas that there are some options, um, some methods that we can use based on stochastic gradient descent. So first of all, what is a non-smooth optimization problem? So a non-smooth optimization problem is shown here. So here we have a convex function. And here we have first order approximates of the function at points x1 and x2. So 
those parts of the function that are differentiables, they have one gradient and at that point, the subgradient is also the gradient because we have just one of them. At non-differentiable points, we have multiple subgradients because there's not just one gradient. But now the question is, is there a method or an update rule similar to stochastic gradient descent, maybe something like stochastic subgradient descent that we could use? And um, for this, let me show you one example of what we have to consider if we want to do this. Assume we have the following cost function. And the cost function depends on two values. We have x1 and x2, and we want to get the minimum value, which is somewhere here. And we want to use a gradient descent method. So now as assume we cut through the cost function at a certain level set. And we do not want to just cut at one level set, we actually cut multiple times and then look at the cost function from above. So here you see um, the control lines, the level sets, and you see this is a smooth cost function. So no matter where we take the gradient at which point of the control line, if we go into the negative direction of the gradient, we will always go towards the minimum of the cost function and find the optimum points. And now let's have a look at a function that has non-differentiable points. Here again, we want to cut through a certain level set and we want to cut the multiple level sets. And we look from above onto this optimization problem. So now if we take the, the subgradient at a non-differentiable point, we actually have multiple subgradients. And now if we want to go into the ne negative direction of a subgradient, what might actually happen is that instead of going into a descent direction, we um, go towards um, an increase, towards an ascent direction. So the negative subgradient does not necessarily give us a descent direction. But still, we can use the update formula as we have seen before. And here we call it subgradient method. And because we do not always have a descent direction, we have to keep track of the best iterate that we get and of the best function value that we can get. And the problem as it is written here is not yet stochastic. It becomes stochastic if we assume we have noisy subgradients. And so here we have additional noise, maybe because of errors in computing or maybe we have measurement noise. And what we assume for this noise is that it has zero mean. And now to be consistent to the first part of the talk, what we can also assume is that we sample our samples randomly from a set, uniformly at random from a set out of n samples. And for the rest of the talk, we just use the interpretation that we have seen before, according to the machine learning interpretation. So now the question is, if we don't always have a descent direction, does this method actually converge? And yes, it does, but it also depends on the step size. So for the stochastic version of the subgradient method, for the convergence, we have an upper bound. And in this case, it even depends on the number of samples we have in our set. However, if we uh, um, assume a diminishing step size according to the roberts monroe condition, we can guarantee almost sure convergence. However, it is important to know that uh, we want the step size to decrease, but not too fast. So what we could do, for example, we could have um, summable but not square summable step sizes. For example, one over t would be an option. So those algorithms are used in multiple scenarios. For example, when we have algorithms for non-differentiable convex optimization in convex analysis, if we have non-differentiable situations, but also in machine learning and deep learning. Because when we optimize a deep neural network, we cannot always guarantee that our cost function or our loss landscape will be convex and smooth. This is why the optimizer or the methods are based on stochastic subgradient methods. And in that case, we have uh, various optimizers that are used, but I don't want to go into 
details of those optimizers, let me just shortly introduce AdaGrad. Because when AdaGrad was developed, it significantly improved the robustness of stochastic gradient descent. Because this algorithm actually also um, considered um, additional information that was available. So let me show you AdaGrad. This is the update formula that we use in AdaGrad. AdaGrad means adaptive subgradient method. So we go again in the direction of the negative um, subgradient, but we adaptively scale the step size by the past subgradients that we have accumulated up to time step t. And by doing this, we can say AdaGrad incorporates the knowledge of the geometry of past iterations. And now let me give you a short example why. So assume we want to minimize this cost function where we have two parameters, w1 and w2. And now what AdaGrad does is it starts at a certain point, goes in the direction of the negative gradient and scales the step size for each parameter over which we want to optimize the function. It scales the step size according to the past subgradients of this parameter. So to give a more visual explanation, so here we have two pictures and here we don't have AdaGrad yet. So assume we have this function where both um, variables that we optimize over have equal weight. If we now go in the direction of the negative gradient by using the same step size, you see stochastic gradient descent or gradient descent would converge to the optimal point quite fast. However, if now we have a cost function where changing one parameter changes the cost function um, more than changing the other parameter, and if we then go into the direction of the negative gradient, we have a slower convergence because we, um, it takes a lot of time to reach the actual minimum of the function. And what AdaGrad does by ad adaptively scaling the step sizes is it tries to make the problem on the right look more like the problem on the left and to um, increase the convergence. The algorithm is also called variable metric projected subgradient method. And now let me explain why. So um, here you see the update formula. Assume we now want to, or we will now substitute this part by ht. So usually we do not need to indicate a projection because we have an unconstrained optimization problem, but now assume we would like to do that. Here you see we want to project um, our result here, which is y, according to a metric ht onto a set w. The projection can be rewritten and um, can be can be explained by this formula. So what we do here is we are looking for uh, a w out of the set, which uh, minimizes this expression. So we want to have the minimum w that is closest to our y according to a certain metric ht. In the case of AdaGrad, the metric is nothing, or this norm here is nothing else as the Mahalanobis norm which is the weighted L2 distance. So the point of the slide is to show you that we implicitly use the weighted L2 distance to update our parameters. So, but now the question is, what if we know that the L2 distance is not the optimal distance to use in our problem? What if we know that the parameter of interest lies on a non-Euclidean manifold? Or if you're dealing with probability vectors and we know, for example, that the KL divergence would be, would be much better for our problem than the L2 norm. Can we um, somehow use this information? So first of all, why would we care? So when we do the convergence analysis and we go through the proof, we go through the steps, we will end up with a basic inequality for the subgradient methods. And this inequality depends, or it has an upper bound. And the upper bound depends on values that uh, use the L2 norm. So now, if we know that this is not the perfect norm, but uh, a different one would suit much better, we would increase our convergence. Now the question is, how can we do that? And where in our update formula could we exchange the L2 norm by a different norm 
So this is the subgradient method, the update rule for the subgradient method we have seen so far. So um, assume again, we indicate the projection, we can rewrite the projection in this way. And by using some math, what one can show is that the equivalent update formula for the first case would be this one. And here you see here we consider the L2 norm. So now if we know this is not a perfect norm, we want to replace it by the one that suits our problem best, we can do it. And this in this case, we call the algorithm stochastic mirror descent. The new norm or the new metric, the new divergence that we use is the Bregman divergence. The Bregman divergence now depends on a strictly convex function, um, which is called the potential function, and it has to be strictly convex because we need an invertible map. And now, depending on our problem, we can choose a suitable Bregman divergence. So, for example, um, so stochastic mirror descent is basically a generalization of stochastic gradient descent. So if we choose the potential function in this way, the, the Bregman divergence would again just be the L2 norm, and we would get our projected subgradient method as we had before. In the case, um, if we have probability vectors, for example, we could use as a potential function the negative entropy, and then the Bregman divergence would just be the KL divergence. So, and in this way, we could just use according to the problem that we're dealing with, we could choose the appropriate convex function um, to uh, use as the potential function. The only um, requirement is we need uh, the, the convex function to be strictly convex. So now the question is, is there a way to express this update as in an update formula with an update rule as the stochastic gradient descent, as we have seen it before. And yes, we can have a normal update rule and adapt an, an update formula as before. By using some math, what we can show is that this expression is actually equivalent to that one. And here we have the Bregman divergence between a parameter w and yt plus 1. So now by writing this, we, we see that this is a projection. What we actually do is we project the yt plus one according to a potential function onto w. So in this case, the Bregman diversion is called Bregman projection. So yt plus one is nothing else as the inverse of our mirror map that we have seen before. And our alternative update rule for stochastic mirror descent is given here. And because this might not be intuitive at the moment, let me show you the big picture of this update rule. So what happens here is basically, we know we want to update our parameters and they are in a certain set. But for some reasons, we can't compute the gradients in this set, or we know that computing the gradient step in a different space would be much better for our problem. So in that case, we use a mirror map, mirror into a different space, perform the gradient step, mirror back, and this is the reason why we need to have an invertible map, and end up in our um, original space again. So sometimes we might end up somewhere here, not in our feasible set, to go actually back to the feasible set of updates, which are allowed in our problem. We now use the Bregman projection and project yt plus one, and back into our set. So this is basically the big picture of stochastic mirror descent. So this algorithm is used in different applications. So for example, online learning, reinforcement learning, as soon as we have more information that we could incorporate about some underlying um, geometry, or if we know that it's not yet two norm that would be suitable in our problem, but it would be a different norm, we can use this algorithm. And it has a faster convergence than just drastic subgradient descent. So now the last question is, what do we do if we have non-IRD data as our samples? Because up to now we assumed we have IRD data that we sample, that we use. So in this case, and um, so in this case, we use this update rule. And this algorithm is called ergodic mirror descent. And now you might notice that this is the same update formula as we have seen before. 
And this is right because this algorithm is based on stochastic mirror descent. And in this case, it's not the update formula that changes, but it's the cost function because we assume we sample our samples from a stochastic process and they're not IID. For the stochastic process, we have certain assumptions. So we assume that it converges to a stationary distribution. But because of time issues, I don't want to go too much into details. I just want to show you the result of the paper. So the paper um, given here is about the ergodic mirror descent, and it shows that there is convergence in expectation and with high probability for certain scenarios where we have non-IID data. And if you want to have uh, more details, about those scenarios, I can recommend the paper or this link here. So now um, let me sum up the talk and what we have shown you today. So if we have a stochastic optimization problem and we have a cost function that we know that is smooth, we can use stochastic gradient descent. But sometimes what we have is we have uh, non-differentiable functions and we want to optimize those. In this case, the stochastic subgradient method would be um, better suited. If uh, we have additional information about some underlying geometry, for example, we could use stochastic mirror descent. And it was also shown that uh, a method based on stochastic mirror descent converges for non-IID input data. So this was basically everything from my side. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, feel free to ask.